Chapter 5 The Stay in Mexico When the great Montezuma had dined, and he knew that some time had passed since our captain and all of us had done the same, he came in the greatest state to our quarters with a numerous company of chieftains, all of them his kinsmen. When Cortez was told that he was approaching, he came out to the middle of the hall to receive him, and Montezuma took him by the hand, and they brought some seats, made according to their usage, and very richly decorated and embroidered with gold in many designs, and Montezuma asked our captain to be seated, and both of them sat down, each on his chair. Then Montezuma began a very good speech, saying that he was greatly rejoiced to have in his house and his kingdom such valiant gentlemen as were Cortez and all of us. That two years ago he had received news of another captain who came to Champleton, and likewise last year they had brought him news of another captain who came with four ships, and that each time he had wished to see them. And now that he had us with him, he was at our service, and would give us all that he possessed. That it must indeed be true that we were those of whom his ancestors in years long past had spoken, saying that men would come here from where the sun rose to rule over these lands, and that we must be those men, as we had fought so valiantly in the fairs at Champleton and Tabasco, and against the Tlaxcalans for they had brought him pictures of the battles true to life. Cortez answered him through our interpreters, who always accompanied him, especially Doña Marina, and said to him that he and all of us did not know how to repay him the great favors we received from him every day. It was true that we came from where the sun rose, and were the vassals and servants of a great prince called the Emperor Don Carlos, who held beneath his sway many and great princes, and that the Emperor, having heard of him, and what a great prince he was, had sent us to these parts to see him, and to beg them to become Christians, the same as our Emperor and all of us, so that his soul and those of all his vassals might be saved. Later on he would further explain how and in what manner this should be done, and how we worship one only true God, and who he is, and many other good things which he should listen to, such as he had already told to the ambassadors, Tendile and Pitalpitok, and Quintalbor, when we were on the sand dunes. When this conference was over, the great Montezuma had already at hand some very rich golden jewels of many patterns, which he gave to our captain, and in the same manner to each one of our captains he gave trifles of gold and three loads of mantles of rich featherwork, and to the soldiers also he gave to each one two loads of mantles and he did it cheerfully, and in every way he seemed to be a great prince. When these things had been distributed, he asked Cortez if we were all brethren and vassals of our great emperor, and Cortez replied, Yes, we were brothers in affection and friendship, and persons of great distinction, and servants of our great king and prince. Further polite speeches passed between Montezuma and Cortez, and as this was the first time he had come to visit us, and so as not to be wearisome, they ceased talking. Montezuma had ordered his stewards that, according to our own use and customs and all things, we should be provided with maize and grinding stones, and women to make bread, and fowls and fruit, and much fodder for the horses. Then Montezuma took leave of our captain and all of us with the greatest courtesy, and we went out with him as far as the street. Cortez ordered us not to go far from our quarters for the present, until we knew better what was expedient. The next day Cortez decided to go to Montezuma's palace, and he first sent to find out what he intended doing and to let him know that we were coming. He took with him four captains, Pedro de Alvarado, Juan Velasquez de Leon, Diego de Orda, and Gonzalo de Sandoval, and five of us soldiers also went with him. When Montezuma knew of our coming, he advanced to the middle of the hall to receive us, accompanied by many of his nephews, for no other chiefs were permitted to enter or hold communication with Montezuma, where he then was, unless it were on important business. Cortez and he paid the greatest reverence to each other, and then they took one another by the hand, and Montezuma made him sit down on his couch on his right hand, and he also bade all of us to be seated on seats which he ordered to be brought. 
Then Cortez began to make an explanation through Doña Marina Nagilav and said that he and all of us were rested, and that in coming to see and converse with such a great prince as he was, we had completed the journey and fulfilled the command which our great king and prince had laid on us. But what he chiefly came to say on behalf of our Lord God had already been brought to his, Montezuma's, knowledge through his ambassadors, Tendile, Vitalpitok, and Quintalbor. At the time when he did us the favor to send the golden sun and moon to the sand dunes, for we told them then that we were Christians and worshipped one true and only God, that we believe in him and worship him, but that those whom they look upon as gods are not so, but are devils, which are evil things, and if their looks are as bad, their deeds are worse. And they could see that they were evil and of little worth, for where we had set up crosses such as those his ambassadors had seen, they dared not appear before them, through fear of them, and that, as time went on, they would notice this. He also told them that, in course of time, our Lord and King would send some men along who might lead very holy lives, much better than we do, who will explain to them all about it, for at present we merely came to give them due warning. And so he prayed him to do what he was asked and carry it into effect. As Montezuma appeared to wish to reply, Cortez broke off his argument, and to all of us who were with him he said, With this we have done our duty, considering it is the first attempt. Montezuma replied, Signor Malinche, I have understood your words and arguments very well before now. From what you said to my servants at the sand dunes, this about three gods and the cross, and all those things that you have preached in the towns to which you have come. We have not made any answer to it, because here, throughout the whole time, we have worshipped our own gods, and thought they were good, as no doubt yours are. So do not trouble to speak to us any more about them at present. Regarding the creation of the world, we have held the same belief for ages past, and for this reason we take it for certain that you are those whom our ancestors predicted would come from the direction of the sunrise. As for your great king, I feel that I am indebted to him, and I will give him of what I possess, for as I have already said two years ago, I heard of the captains who came in ships from the direction in which you came, and they said that they were the servants of this, your great king, and I wish to know if you are all one and the same. Cortez replied, Yes, that we were all brethren and servants of our emperor, and that those men came to examine the way and the seas and the ports, so as to know them well in order that we might follow as we had done. Montezuma was referring to the expeditions of Francisco Hernández de Cordova and of Grijalva, and he said that ever since that time he had wished to capture some of those men who had come so as to keep them in his kingdoms and cities, and to do them honor. And his gods had now fulfilled his desires, for now that we were in his home, which we might call our own, we should rejoice and take our rest, for there we should be well treated. And if he had on other occasions sent to say that we should not enter his city, it was not of his free will, but because his vassals were afraid, for they said that we shot our flashes of lightning and killed many Indians with our horses, and that we were angry to us, and other childish stories. And now that he had seen our persons and knew we were flesh and bone, and had sound sense, and that we were very valiant, for these reasons he held us in much higher regard than he did from their reports, and he would share his possessions with us. Then Cortez and all of us answered that we thanked him sincerely for such signal goodwill, and Montezuma said, laughing, for he was very merry at his princely way of speaking, Malinche, I know very well that these people of Tlaxcala, with whom you are such good friends, have told you that I am a sort of god or teule, and that everything in my house is, is made of gold and silver and precious stones. I know well enough that you are wise and did not believe it, but took it as a joke. Behold now, Signor Malinche, my body is of flesh and bone, like yours, my houses and palaces of stone and wood and lime. That I am a great king and inherit the riches of my ancestors is true, but not all the nonsense and lies that they have told you about me. Although, of course, you treated it as a joke, as I did your thunder and lightning. Cortez answered him, also laughing, 
and said that opponents and enemies always say evil things without truth in them, of those whom they hate, and that he well knew that he could not hope to fight another prince more magnificent in these countries, and that not without reason had he been so vaunted to our emperor. While this great conversation was going on, Montezuma secretly sent a great cacique, one of his nephews who was in his company, to order his stewards to bring certain pieces of gold, which it seems must have been put apart to give to Cortez. And ten loads of fine cloth which he apportioned, the gold and mantles between Cortez and the four captains, and to each of us soldiers he gave two golden necklaces, each necklace being worth ten pesos, and two loads of mantles. The gold that he then gave us was worth in all more than a thousand pesos, and he gave it all cheerfully, and with the air of a great and valiant prince. And as it was now past midday, so as not to appear important, or importunate, Cortez said to him, Senor Montezuma, you always have the habit of heaping load upon load in every day conferring favors on us, and it is already your dinner time. Montezuma replied that he thanked us for coming to see him, and then we took our leave with the greatest courtesy, and we went to our lodgings. And as we went along, we spoke of the good manners and breeding which he showed in everything, and that we should show him in all ways the greatest respect, doffing our quilted caps when we passed before him. And this we always did. The great Montezuma was about forty years old, of good height and well-proportioned, slender and spare flesh, not very swarthy, but of the natural color and shade of an Indian. He did not wear his hair long, but so as just to cover his ears. His scanty black beard was well-shaped and thin. His face was somewhat long, but cheerful, and he had good eyes and showed in his appearance and manner both tenderness and, when necessary, gravity. He was very neat and clean and bathed once every day in the afternoon. He had many women as mistresses, daughters of chieftains, and he had two great cacicas as his legitimate wives. He was free from unnatural offenses. The clothes that he wore one day he did not put on again until four days later. He had over two hundred chieftains in his guard, in other rooms close to his own. Not that all were meant to converse with him, but only one or another. And when they went to speak to him, they were obliged to take off their rich mantles and put on others of little worth. But they had to be clean, and they had to enter barefoot, with their eyes lowered to the ground, and not to look up in his face. And they made him three obeisances and said, Lord, my Lord, my great Lord, before they came up to him. And then they made their report, and with a few words he dismissed them. And on taking leave they did not turn their backs, but kept their faces towards him, with their eyes to the ground. And they did not turn their backs until they left the room. I noticed another thing, that when other great chiefs came from distant lands about disputes or business, when they reached the apartments of the great Montezuma, they had to come barefoot and with poor mantles, and they might not enter directly into the palace, but had to loiter about a little while on one side of the palace door, for to enter hurriedly was considered to be disrespectful. For each meal, over thirty different dishes were prepared by his cooks according to their ways and usage, and they placed small pottery braziers beneath the dishes so that they should not be cold. They prepared more than three hundred plates of the food that Montezuma was going to eat, and more than a thousand for the guard. When he was going to eat, Montezuma would sometimes go out with his chiefs and stewards, and they would point out to him which dish was best, and of what birds and other things it was composed. And as they advised him, so he would eat. But it was not often that he would go out to see the food, and then merely as a pastime. I have heard it said that they were, that they were wont to cook for him the flesh of young boys, but as he had such a variety of dishes made of so many things, we could not succeed in seeing if they were made of human flesh or of other things, for they daily cooked fowls, turkeys, pheasants, native partridges, quail, tame and wild ducks, venison, wild boar, reed birds, pigeons, hares, and rabbits, and many sorts of birds and other things which are bred in this country, and they are so numerous that I cannot finish naming them in a hurry, so we had no insight into it. 
but I know for certain that after our captain censured the sacrifice of human beings and the eating of their flesh, he ordered that such food should not be prepared for him thenceforth. Let us cease speaking of this and return to the way things were served to him at mealtimes. It was in this way. If it was cold, they made up a large fire of live coals of a firewood made from the bark of trees which did not give off any smoke, and the scent of the bark which the fire was made was very fragrant, and so that it should not give off more heat than he required, they placed in front of it a sort of screen adorned with figures of idols worked in gold. He was seated on a low stool, soft and richly worked, and the table, which was also low, was made in the same style as the seats, and on it they placed the tablecloths of white cloth and some rather long napkins of the same material. Four very beautiful, cleanly women brought water for his hands in a sort of deep basin which they called zikales, and they held others like plates below to catch the water, and they brought him towels. The two other women brought him tortilla bread, and as soon as he began to eat, they placed before him a sort of wooden screen painted over with gold, so that no one should watch him eating. Then the four women stood aside, and four great chieftains who were old men came and stood beside them, and with these Montezuma now and then conversed, and asked them questions, and as a great favor he would give to each of these elders a dish of what was to him tasted best. They say that these elders were his near relations, and were his counselors and judges of lawsuits, and the dishes and food which Montezuma gave them, they ate standing up with much reverence and without looking at his face. He was served on Cholula earthenware, either red or black. While he was at his meal, the men of his guard, who were in the rooms near to that of Montezuma, never dreamt of making any noise or speaking aloud. They brought him fruit of all the different kinds that the land produced, but he ate very little of it. From time to time they brought him in cup-shaped vessels of pure gold a certain drink made from cacao, and the women served this drink to him with great reverence. Sometimes at mealtimes there were present some very ugly humpbacks, very small of stature, and their bodies almost broken in half, who are their jesters, and other Indians who must have been buffoons, who told him witty sayings, and others who sang and danced, for Montezuma was fond of pleasure and song, and to these he ordered to be given what was left of the food in the jugs of cacao. Then the same four women removed the tablecloths, and with much ceremony they brought water for his hands. And Montezuma talked with those four old chieftains about things that interested him, and they took leave of him with the great reverence in which they held him, and he remained to repose. As soon as the great Montezuma had dined, all the men of the guard had their meal, and as many more of the other house servants, and it seems to me that they brought out over a thousand dishes of food, of which I have spoken, and then over two thousand jugs of cacao all frothed up, and they make it in Mexico, and a limitless quantity of fruit, so that with his women and female servants and bread makers and cacao makers, his expenses must have been very great. Let us cease talking about the expenses and the food for his household, and let us speak of the stewards and the treasures and the stores and pantries, and of those who had charge of the houses where the maize was stored. I say that there would be so much to write about, each thing by itself, that I should not know where to begin, but we stood astonished at the excellent arrangements and the great abundance of provisions that he had in all but I must add what I had forgotten, for it is as well to go back and relate it, and that is, that while Montezuma was at table eating, as I have described, there were waiting on him two other graceful women to bring him tortillas, kneaded with eggs and other sustaining ingredients, and these tortillas were very white, and they were brought on plates covered with clean napkins, and they also brought him another kind of bread, like long balls kneaded with other kinds of sustaining food, and pan pakor, for so they call it in this country, which is a sort of waver. There were also placed on the table three tubes, much painted and gilded, which held liquid ambar, mixed with certain herbs which they call tobacco. And when he had finished eating, after they had danced before him and sung, and the table was removed, he inhaled the smoke from one of those tubes, but he took very little of it, 
and with that he fell asleep. I remember that at that time his steward was a great cacique to whom we gave the name of Tapia, and he kept his accounts of all the revenue that was brought to Montezuma in his books, which were made of paper, which they call a mal, and he had a great house full of these books. Now we must leave the books and the accounts, for it is outside our story, how Montezuma had two houses full of every sort of arms, many of them richly adorned with gold and precious stones. There were shields, great and small, and a sort of broadsword, and others like two-handed swords set with stone knives, which cut much better than our swords, and lances longer than ours are, with a fathom of blade with many knives set in it, which even when they are driven into a buckler or shield do not come out. In fact, they cut like razors so that they can shave their heads with them. There were very good bows and arrows and double-pointed lances and others with one point, as well as their throwing sticks and many slings and round stones shaped by hand and some sort of artful shields which are made that they can be rolled up so as not to be in the way when they are not fighting. And when they are needed for fighting, they let them fall down, and they cover the body from top to toe. There was also much quilted cotton armor, richly ornamented on the outside with many colored feathers, used as devices and distinguishing marks. And there were casks or helmets made of wood and bone, also highly decorated with feathers on the outside, and there were other arms of other makes, which, so as to avoid prolixity, I will not describe. And there were artisans who were skilled in such things, and worked at them, and stewards who had charge of the arms. Let us leave this and proceed to the aviary, and I am forced to abstain from enumerating every kind of bird that there was there, and its peculiarity, for there was something from the royal eagle and other smaller eagles, and many other birds of great size, down to tiny birds of many colored plumage, also the birds from which they take the rich plumage which they use in their green feather work. The birds which have these feathers are about the size of the magpies in Spain. They are called in this country quesales, and there are other birds which have feathers of five colors, green, red, white, yellow, and blue. I don't remember what they are called. Then there were parrots of many different colors, and there are so many of them that I forget their names, not to mention the beautifully marked ducks and other larger ones like them. From all these birds they plucked the feathers when the time was right to do so, and the feathers grew again. All the birds that I have spoken about breed in these houses, and in the setting season certain Indian men and women who look after the birds place the eggs under them and clean the nests and feed them, so that each kind of bird has its proper food. In this house that I have spoken of, there is a great tank of fresh water, and in it there are other sorts of birds with long, stilted legs, with body, wings, and tail, all red. I don't know their names, but on the island of Cuba, they are called Ipiris, and there are others something like them, and there are also in that tank many other kinds of birds which always live in the water. Let us leave this, and go on to another great house, where they keep many idols, and they say that they are their fierce gods, and with them many kinds of carnivorous beasts of prey, tigers and two kinds of lions, and animals something like wolves and foxes, and other smaller carnivorous animals, and all these carnivores they feed with flesh, and the greater number of them breed in the house. They give them as food deer and fowls, dogs and other things which they are used to hunt, and I have heard it said that they feed them on the bodies of the Indians who have been sacrificed. It is in this way, you have already heard me say, that when the sacrifice a wretched Indian, they saw open the chest with stone knives in haste to tear out the palpitating heart and blood, and offer it to their idols in whose name the sacrifice is made. Then they cut off the thighs, arms, and head, and eat the former at feasts and banquets, and the head they hang up on some beams, and the body of the man sacrificed is not eaten, but given to these fierce animals. They also have in that cursed house many vipers and poisonous snakes, which carry on their tails things that sound like bells. These are the worst vipers of all, and they keep them in jars and great pottery vessels with many feathers, 
and there they lay their eggs and rear their young and they give them to eat the bodies of the Indians who have been sacrificed, and the flesh of dogs which they are in the habit of breeding. Let me speak now of the infernal noise when the lions and tigers roared, and the jackals and foxes howled, and the serpents hissed. It was horrible to listen to, and it seemed like a hell. Let us go on and speak of the skilled workmen Montezuma employed in every craft that was practiced among them. We will begin with lapidaries, and workers in gold and silver, and all the hollow work, which even the great goldsmiths in Spain were forced to admire. And of these there were a great number of the best in a town named Azcapotzalco, a league from Mexico. Then, for working precious stones and chalchuites, which are like emeralds, there were other great artists. Let us go on to the great craftsmen in featherwork, and painters and sculptors who were most refined, then to the Indian women who did the weaving and the washing, who made such an immense quantity of fine fabrics with wonderful featherwork designs. The greater part of it was brought daily from some towns of the province on the north coast, near Veracruz, called Cotaxla. In the house of the great Montezuma himself, all the daughters of chieftains whom he had as mistresses always wore beautiful things, and there were many daughters of Mexican citizens who lived in retirement and wished to appear to be like nuns, who also did weaving, but it was wholly of featherwork. These nuns had their houses near the great queue of Huichilobos, and out of devotion to it, or to another idol, that of a woman who was said to be their mediatrix in the matter of marriage, their fathers placed them in that religious retirement until they married and until they were taken out thence to be married. Let us go on and tell about the great number of dancers kept by the great Montezuma for his amusement, and others who used stilts on their feet, and others who flew when they danced up in the air, and others like Mary Andrews, and I may say that there was a district full of these people who had no other occupation. Let us go on and speak of the workmen that he had as stone cutters, masons, carpenters, all of whom attended to the work of his houses. I say that he had as many as he wished for. We must not forget the gardens of flowers and sweet-scented trees, and the many kinds that there were of them, and the arrangement of them in the walks, and the ponds, and tanks of fresh water, where the water entered at one end and flowed out of the other, and the baths which he had there and the variety of small birds that nested in the branches, and the medicinal and useful herbs that were in the gardens. It was a wonder to see, and to take care of it there were many gardeners. Everything was made in masonry and well cemented, baths and walks and closets and apartments like summer houses where they danced and sang. There was as much to be seen in these gardens as there was everywhere else, and we could not tire of witnessing his great power. Thus, as a consequence of so many crafts being practiced among them, a large number of skilled Indians were employed. As we had already been four days in Mexico, and neither the captain nor any of us had left our lodgings except to go to the houses and gardens, Cortez said to us that it would be well to go to the great plaza of Tlaltetloco and see the great temple of Huichilobos, that he wished to consult the great Montezuma and have his approval. For this purpose he sent Jeronimo de Aguilar and the Doña Marina as messengers, and with them went our captain's small page named Pateguilla, who already understood something of the language. When Montezuma knew his wishes, he sent to say that we were welcome to go. On the other hand, as he was afraid that we might do some dishonor to his idols, he determined to go with us himself with many of his chieftains. He came out from his palace in his rich litter, but when half the distance had been traversed and he was near some oratories, he stepped out of the litter, for he thought it a great affront to his idols to go to their house and temple in that manner. Some of the great chieftains supported him with their arms, and the tribal lords went in front of him carrying two staves like scepters held on high, which was a sign that the great Montezuma was coming. When he went in his litter he carried a wand half of gold and half of wood, which was held up like a wand of justice. So he went on and ascended the great queue, accompanied by many priests, and he began to burn incense and perform other ceremonies to Wichilobos. Our captain, and all of those who had horses, 
went to Tlatlaniloco on horseback, and nearly all of his soldiers were fully equipped, and many caciques whom Montezuma had sent for that purpose went in our company. When we arrived at the great marketplace called Tlatlaniloco, we were astounded at the number of people and the quantity of merchandise that it contained, and at the good order and control that was maintained, for we had never seen such a thing before. The chieftains who accompanied us acted as guides. Each kind of merchandise was kept by itself and had its fixed place marked out. Let us begin with the dealers in gold, silver, and precious stones, feathers, mantles, and embroidered goods. Then there were other wares consisting of Indian slaves, both men and women, and I say that they bring as many of them to that great market for sale as the Portuguese bring Negroes from Guinea, and they brought them along tied to long poles, with collars round their necks so that they could not escape, and others they left free. Next there were other traders who sold great pieces of cloth and cotton and articles of twisted thread, and there were cacahueteros who sold cacao. In this way one could see every sort of merchandise that is to be found in the whole of New Spain. There were those who sold cloths of henequen and ropes and sandals with which they are shod, which are made from the same plant, and sweet-cooked roots and other tubers which they get from this plant, all were kept in one part of the market in the place assigned to them. In another part there were skins of tigers and lions, of otters and jackals, deer and other animals, and badgers and mountain cats, some tanned and others untanned, and other classes of merchandise. Let us go on and speak of those who sold beans and sage, and other vegetables and herbs in another part, and to those who sold fowls, cocks with wattles, rabbits, hares, deer, mallards, young ducks, and other things of that sort in their part of the market. And let us also mention the fruiters, and the women who sold cooked food, dough and tripe in their own part of the market. Then every sort of pottery made in a thousand different forms, from great water jars to little jugs, these also had a place to themselves. Then those who sold honey and honey paste, and other dainties like nut paste, and those who sold lumber, boards, cradles, beams, blocks, and benches, each article by itself, and the vendors of ocote firewood, and other things of a similar nature. But why do I waste so many words in recounting what they sell in that great market? for I shall never finish if I tell it all in detail. Paper, which in this country is called amal, and reed scented with liquid ambar, and full of tobacco, and yellow ointments and things of that sort are sold by themselves, and much cochineal is sold under the arcades, which are in that great marketplace. And there are many vendors of herbs and other sorts of trades. There are also buildings where three magistrates sit in judgment, and their executive officers like Agualquis, who inspect the merchandise. I am forgetting those who sell salt, and those who make the stone knives, and how they split them off the stone itself, and the fishermen, and fisherwomen, and others who sell some small cakes made from a sort of ooze which they get out of the great lake, which curdles, and from this they make a bread having a flavor something like cheese. There are for sale axes of brass and copper and tin, and gourds and gaily painted jars made of wood. I could wish that I had finished telling of all the things which are sold there, but they are so numerous and of such different quality, and the great marketplace with its surrounding arcades was so crowded with people that one would not have been able to see and inquire about it all in two days. Then we went to the great queue. And when we were already approaching its great courts, before leaving the marketplace itself, there were many more merchants, who, as I was told, brought gold for sale in grains, just as it is taken from the mines. The gold is placed in thin quills of the geese of the country, white quills, so the gold can be seen through. And according to the length and thickness of the quills, they arrange their accounts with one another. How much so many mantles, or or so many gourds full of cacao were worth, or how many slaves, or whatever other thing they were exchanging. Before reaching the great queue, there is a great enclosure of courts. It seems to me larger than the plaza of Salamanca, with two walls of masonry surrounding it, and the court itself all paved with very smooth great white flagstones. 
and where there were not these stones, it was cemented and burnished and all very clean, so that one could not find any dust or straw in the whole place. When we arrived near the great queue, and before we had ascended a single step of it, the great Montezuma sent down from above, where he was making his sacrifices, six priests and two chieftains to accompany our captain. On ascending the steps, which are one hundred and fourteen in number, they attempted to take him by the arm so as to help him to ascend, thinking that he would get tired, as they were accustomed to assist their lord Montezuma. But Cortez would not allow them to come near him. When we got to the top of the great queue, on a small plaza which had been made on the top, where there was a space like a platform with some large stones placed on it, on which they put the poor Indian for sacrifice, there was a bulky image like a dragon, and other evil figures, and much blood shed that very day. When we arrived there, Montezuma came out of an oratory where his cursed idols were, at the summit of the great queue and two priests came with him, and after paying great reverence to Cortez and to all of us, he said, You must be tired, Signor Malinche, from ascending this our great queue. But Cortez replied through our interpreters who were with us that he and his companions were never tired by anything. Then Montezuma took him by the hand and told him to look at his great city and all the other cities that were standing in the water and the many other towns on the lake round the land, and that if he had not seen the great marketplace well, that from where they were they could see it better. So we stood looking about us, for that huge and cursed temple stood so high that from it one could see over everything very well, and we saw the three causeways which led into Mexico, that is, the causeway of Itzapalapa, by which we had entered four days before, and that of Tacuba, and that of Tepeyakia. And we saw the fresh water that comes from Chapultepec, which supplies the city, and we saw the bridges on the three causeways, which were built at certain distances apart through which the water of the lake flowed in and out from one side to the other. And we beheld on that great lake a great multitude of canoes, some coming with supplies of food and others returning loaded with cargoes of merchandise, and we saw that from every house of that great city and of all the other cities that were built in the water, it was impossible to pass from house to house, except by drawbridges which were made of wood or in canoes. And we saw in those cities queues and oratories like towers and fortresses, and all gleaming white. And it was a wonderful thing to behold. Then the houses with flat roofs, and on the causeways other small towers and oratories which were like fortresses. After having examined and considered all that we had seen, we turned to look at the great marketplace and the crowds of people that were in it, some buying and others selling, so that the murmur and hum of their voices and words that they used could be heard more than a league off. Some of the soldiers among us who had been in many parts of the world, in Constantinople and all over Italy and in Rome, said that so large a marketplace and so full of people and so well regulated and arranged they had never beheld before. Let us leave this, and return to our captain, who said to Fray Bartolome de Olmedo, who happened to be near by him, It seems to me, Signor Padre, that it would be a good thing to throw out a feeler to Montezuma as to whether he would allow us to build our church here. And the Padre replied that it would be a good thing if it were successful, but it seemed to him that it was not quite a suitable time to speak about it, for Montezuma did not appear to be inclined to do such a thing. Then our Cortez said to Montezuma, Your Highness is indeed a very great prince, and worthy of even greater things. We are rejoiced to see your cities, and as we are here in your temple, what I now beg as a favor is that you will show us your gods and tombs. Montezuma replied that he must first speak with his high priest, and when he had spoken to them, he said that we might enter into a small tower and apartment, a sort of hall, where there were two altars, which were richly carved boardings on the top of the roof. On each altar were two figures like giants with very tall bodies, and very fat, and the first which stood on the right hand, they said, was the figure of Richelobos, their god of war. It had a very broad face, and monstrous and terrible eyes, 
and the whole of his body was covered with precious stones and gold and pearls and with seed pearls stuck on with a paste that they make in this country out of a sort of root and all the body and head was covered with it and the body was girdled by great snakes made of gold and precious stones and in one hand he held now a bow and in the other some arrows and another small idol stood by him they said was his page and he held a short lance and a shield richly decorated with gold and stones which a lobos had round his neck some indian faces and other things like hearts of indians the former made of gold and the latter of silver with many precious blue stones there were some braziers with incense which they call copal and in them they were burning the hearts of the three indians whom they had sacrificed that day and they had made the sacrifice with smoke and copal all the walls of the oratory were so splashed and encrusted with blood that they were black the floor was the same and the whole place stank vilely then we saw on the other side of the land left hand there stood the other great image the same height as Wichilobos, and it had a face like a bear and eyes that shone made of their mirrors which they called Tescat, and the body plastered with precious stones like that of Wichilobos, for they say that the two are brothers and that this Tezcatebuca was the god of hell and had charge of the souls of the mexicans and his body was girt with figures like little devils with snakes tails the walls were so clotted with blood and the soil so bathed with it that in the slaughterhouses of spain there is not such another stench they had offered to this idol five hearts for the day's sacrifices in the highest part of the queue there was a recess of which the woodwork was very richly worked and it was another image half man and half lizard with precious stones all over it and half the body covered with a mantle they say that the body of this figure is full of the seeds that there are in the world, and they say that it is the god of seed time and harvest. But I do not remember its name, and everything was covered with blood, both walls and altar, and the stench was such that we could hardly wait the moment to get out of it. They had an exceedingly large drum there, too, and when they beat it, the sound was so dismal and like, so to say, an instrument of the infernal regions, that one could hear it at a distance of two leagues, and they said that the skins it was covered with were those of great snakes. In that small place there were many diabolical things to be seen, bugles and trumpets and knives, and many hearts of Indians that they had burned in fumigating their idols, and everything was so clotted with blood, and there was so much of it, that I cursed the whole of it, and as it stank like a slaughterhouse, we hastened to clear out of such a bad stench and worse sight. Our captain said to Montezuma through our interpreter, half laughing, Signor Montezuma, I do not understand how such a great prince and wise man as you are has not come to the conclusion in your mind that these idols of yours are not gods, but evil things that are called devils. And so that you may know it, and you are all your priests may see it clearly, do me the favor to approve of my placing a cross here on the top of this tower, and that in one part of these oratories where your witchy lobos at Escatepuca stand, we may divide off a space where we can set up an image of Our Lady, an image which Montezuma had already seen, and you will see by the fear in which these idols hold it that they are deceiving you. Montezuma replied half angrily, and the two priests who were with him showed great annoyance and said, Signor Malinche, if I had known that you would have said such defamatory things, I would not have shown you my gods. We consider them to be very good, for they give us health and rains and good seed times and seasons and as many victories as we desire, and we are obliged to worship them and make sacrifices, and I pray you not to say another word to their dishonor. When our captain heard that and noted the angry looks, he did not refer again to the subject, but said with a cheerful manner, It is time for your excellency and for us to return. And Montezuma replied that it was well, but that he had to pray and offer certain sacrifices on account of the great Tatakul, that is to say, sin, which he had committed in allowing us to ascend his great queue, 
and being the cause of our being permitted to see his gods, and of our dishonoring them by speaking evil of them, so that before he left he must pray and worship. Then Cortez said, I ask your pardon if it be so. And then we went down the steps, and as they numbered one hundred and fourteen, and some of our soldiers were suffering from tumors and abscesses, their legs were tired by the descent. I will leave off talking about the oratory, and I will give any impressions of its surroundings, and if I do not describe it as accurately as I should do, do not wonder at it, for at that time I had other things to think about regarding what we had on hand, that is to say, my soldiers' duties, and what my captain ordered me to do, and not about telling stories. To go back to the facts, it seems to me that the circuit of the Great Queue was equal to that of six large sites such as they measure in this country, and from below up to where a small tower stood, where they kept their idols, it narrowed, and in the middle of the lofty queue up to its highest point, there were five hollows like barbicans, but open without screens, and as there are many queues painted on the banners of the conquerors, and on one which I possess, any one who has seen them can infer what they looked like from the outside, better than I myself saw and understood it. There was a report that at the time they began to build that great queue, all the inhabitants of that mighty city had placed as offerings in the foundations gold and silver and pearls and precious stones, and had bathed them with the blood of the many Indian prisoners of war who were sacrificed, and had placed there every sort and kind of seed that the land produces, so that their idols should give them victories and riches and large crops. Some of my inquisitive readers will ask, how could we come to know that into the foundations of that great queue they cast gold and silver and precious chalchuites and seeds, and watered them with the human blood of the Indians whom they sacrificed, when it was more than a thousand years ago that they built and made it? The answer I give to this is that after we took that great and strong city, and the sites were apportioned, it was then proposed that in the place of that great queue we should build a church to our patron and guide, Señor Santiago and a great part of the site of the great temple of which Lobos was occupied by the site of the Holy Church, and when they opened the foundations in order to strengthen them, they found much gold and silver and chalchuites and pearls and seed pearls and other stones, and a settler in Mexico who occupied another part of the same site found the same things, and the officers of His Majesty's treasury demanded them, saying that they belonged by right to His Majesty, and there was a lawsuit about it, I do not remember what happened except that they sought information from the caciques and chieftains of Mexico and from Guatemoc, who was then alive, and they said that it was true that all the inhabitants of Mexico at that time cast into the foundations those jewels and all the rest of the things, and that so it was noted in their books and pictures of ancient things, and from this cause those riches were preserved for the building of the Holy Church of Santiago. Let us leave this and speak of the great and splendid courts which were in front of the Temple of Huichilobos, where now stands the church of Señor Santiago, which was called Tlaltelopo, for so they were accustomed to call it. I have already said that there were two walls of masonry which had to be passed before entering, and that the court was paved with white stones like flagstones, carefully whitewashed and burnished and clean, and it was as large and as broad as the plaza of Salamanca, a little way apart from the great queue, there was another small tower, which was also an idol house, or a true hell, for it had at the opening of one gate a most terrible mouth, such as they depict, saying that such there are in hell. The mouth was opened with great fangs to devour souls, and here too were some groups of devils and bodies of serpents close to the door, and a little way off was a place of sacrifice, all blood-stained and black with smoke, and encrusted with blood and there were many great olas and cantros and tinajas of water inside the house, for it was here that they cooked the flesh of the unfortunate Indians who were sacrificed, which was eaten by the priests. There were also near the place of sacrifice many large knives and chopping blocks, such as those on which they cut up meat in the slaughterhouses. Then behind that cursed house, some distance away from it, were some great piles of firewood, and not far from them, a large tank of water which rises and falls, the water coming through a tube from the covered channel which enters the city from Chapultepec. 
I always called that house the Infernal Regions. Let us go on beyond the court to another queue where the great Mexican princes were buried, where also there were many idols, and all was full of blood and smoke. And it had other doorways with hellish figures, and then near the queue was another full of skulls and large bones, arranged in perfect order, which one could look at but could not count, for there were too many of them. The skulls were by themselves, and the bones in two separate piles. In that place there were other idols, and in every house or queue or oratory that I have mentioned there were priests with long robes of black cloth, and long hoods like those of the Dominicans, and slightly resembling those of the canons. The hair of these priests was very long and so matted that it could not be separated or disentangled, and most of them had their ears scarified, and their hair was clotted with blood. Now, let us go on. There were other queues, a little way from where the skulls were, which contained other idols in places of sacrifices, decorated with other evil paintings, and they said that those idols were intercessors in the marriages of men. I do not want to delay any longer telling about idols, but will only add that all around that great court there were many houses, not lofty, used and occupied by the priests and other Indians who had charge of the idols. On one side there was another much larger pond or tank of very clear water, dedicated solely to the service of Huichilobos and Tezcatapuca, and the water entered that pond through covered pipes which came from Chupultepec. Near to this were other large buildings, such as a sort of nunnery, where many of the daughters of the inhabitants of Mexico were sheltered like nuns up to the time they were married, and there stood two idols with the figures of women, which were the intercessors in the marriages of women, and women made sacrifices to them, and held festivals so that they should see them that should give them good husbands. I have spent a long time talking about this great queue of Tlotli Loco and its courts, but I say that it was the greatest temple in the whole of Mexico, although there were many others. Very splendid. Four or five parishes or districts possessed between them an oratory with its idols, and as they were very numerous, I have not kept count of them all. I will go on and say that the great oratory that they had in Cholula was higher than that of Mexico, for it had 120 steps, and according to what they say, they held the idol of Cholula to be good, and they went to it on pilgrimages from all parts of New Spain to obtain absolution, and for this reason they built for it such a splendid queue. But it is of another form from that of Mexico, although the courts are the same, very large with a double wall. I may add that the queue in the city of Texcoco was very lofty, having 117 steps, and the courts were broad and fine, shaped in a different form from the others. It is a laughable matter that every province had its idols, and those of one province or city were of no use to the others. Thus they had an infinite number of idols, and they made sacrifices to them all. After our captain and all of us were tired of walking about and seeing such a diversity of idols and their sacrifices, we returned to our quarters all the time accompanied by many caciques and chieftains who Montezuma sent with us. When our captain and the friar of the Order of Mercy saw that Montezuma was not willing that we should set up a cross on the temple of Huichilobos, nor build a church there, and because ever since we entered the city of Mexico, when mass was said, we had to place an altar on tables and then to dismantle it again, it was decided that we should ask Montezuma's stewards for masons, so that we should, could make a church in our quarters. The stewards said they would tell Montezuma of our wishes, and Montezuma gave his permission and ordered us to be supplied with all the material we needed. In two days we had our church finished, and the Holy Cross set up in front of our apartments, and Mass was said there every day until the wine gave out. As Cortez and some of the other captains and the friar had been ill during the war in Tlaxcala, they made the wine that we had for Mass go too fast, but after it was all finished, we still went to the church daily and prayed on our knees before the altar and images, for one reason, because we were obliged to do so as Christians and it was a good habit, and for another reason, in order that Montezuma and all his captains should observe it and should witness our adoration and see us on our knees before the cross, especially when we intoned the Ave Maria, so that it might incline them towards it. When we were all assembled in those chambers, as it was our habit to inquire into, 
and want to know everything while we were looking for the best and most convenient site to place the altar. Two of our soldiers, one of whom was a carpenter named Alonso Yanez, noticed on one of the walls marks showing that there had been a door there and that it had been closed up and carefully plastered over and burnished. Now, as there was a rumor, and we had heard the story that Montezuma kept the treasure of his father, Aksayaka, in that building, it was suspected that it might be in this chamber, which had been closed up and cemented only a few days before. Yanye spoke about it to Juan Velasquez de Leon and Francisco de Lugo, and those captains told the story to Cortez, and the door was secretly opened. When it was opened, Cortez and some of his captains went in first, and they saw such a number of jewels and slabs and plates of gold and chalchuites and other great riches that they were quite carried away and did not know what to say about such wealth. The news soon spread among all the other captains and soldiers, and very secretly we went in to see it. When I saw it, I marveled, and as at that time I was a youth and had never seen such riches as those in my life before, I took it for certain that there could not be another such store of wealth in the whole world. It was decided by all our captains and soldiers that we should not dream of touching a particle of it, but that the stone should immediately be put back in the doorway, and it should be sealed up and cemented just as we had found it, and that it should not be spoken about, lest it should reach Montezuma's ears until times should alter. Let us leave this about the riches, and say that four of our captains took Cortez aside in the church, with a dozen soldiers in whom he trusted and confided, and I was one of them, and we asked him to look at the net and trap in which we found ourselves, and to consider the great strength of that city, and observe the causeways and bridges, and to think over the words of warning that we had been given in all the towns we had passed through, that Montezuma had been advised by his huichilobos to allow us to enter into the city, and when we were there to kill us, that he, Cortez, should remember that the hearts of the men were very changeable, especially those of Indians, and he should not repose trust in the goodwill and affection that Montezuma was showing us, for at some time or other when the wish occurred to him, he would order us to be attacked, and by the stoppage of our supplies, of food or of water, or by raising any of the bridges, we should be rendered helpless. Then, considering the great multitude of Indian warriors that Montezuma had as his guard, what should we be able to do either in offense or defense, and as all the houses were built in the water, how could our friends the Tlashkalans enter and come to our aid? He should think over all this that we had said, and if we wished to safeguard our lives, that we should at once, without further delay, seize Montezuma and should not wait until next day to do it. He should also remember that all the gold that Montezuma had given us, and all that we had seen in the treasure of his father, Akshayaka, and all the food which we ate, all would be turned to arsenic poison on our bodies, where we could neither sleep by night nor day nor rest ourselves while these thoughts were in our minds, and that if any of our soldiers should give him other advice short of this, they would be senseless beasts who were dazed by the gold, incapable of looking death in the face. When Cortez heard this, he replied, Don't you imagine, gentlemen, that I am asleep, or that I am free from the same anxiety you must have felt that it is so with me, but what possibility is there of our doing a deed of such great daring as to see such a great prince in his own palace, surrounded as he is by his own guards and warriors? By what scheme or artifice can we carry it out, so that he should not call in his warriors to attack us at once? Our captains replied, that is, Juan Velasquez de Leon and Diego de Arda, Gonzalo de Sandoval and Pedro de Alvarado, that with smooth speeches he should be got out of his halls, and brought to our quarters, and should be told that he must remain a prisoner, and if he made a disturbance or cried out that, we, that he would pay for it with his life, that if Cortez did not want to do this at once, we should give them permission to do it, as they were ready for the work, for between the two great dangers in which we found ourselves, it was better and more to the purpose to seize Montezuma than to wait until he attacked us, for if he began the attack, what chance should we have? Some of the soldiers also told Cortez that it seemed to us that Montezuma's stewards, who were employed in providing us with food, were insolent and did not bring it courteously as during the first days. 
Also two of our allies, the Tlashkal and Indian, said secretly to Hieronimo, Hieronimo de Aguilar, our interpreter, that the Mexicans had not appeared to be well disposed towards us during the last two days. So we stayed a good hour discussing the question whether or not we should take Montezuma prisoner, and how it was to be done, and to our captain this last advice seemed opportune, that in any case we should take him prisoner, and we left it until the next day. All that night we were praying to God that our plan might tend to his holy service. The next morning, after these consultations, there arrived very secretly two Tlaxcalan Indians with letters from Villarica, and what they contained was the news that Juan de Escalante, who had remained there as chief alguacil, and six of our soldiers had been killed in a battle against the Mexicans, that his horse had also been slain, and many Totonacs who were in his company. Moreover, all the towns of the Sierra and Sempoala and its subject towns were in revolt and refused to bring food or serve in the fort. They, the Spaniards, did not know what to do, for as formerly they had been taken by the Tuviteuls, and now, after this disaster, both the Totonacs and Mexicans were like wild animals, and they could hold them to nothing and did not know what steps to take. When we heard this news, God knows what sorrow affected us all, for this was the first disaster we had suffered in New Spain.